Hey, do you wish to see an absolute meme mobile tackle endurance races? Yes, I am talking about this 4K which I got for Mission 34 in my Gran Turismo 4 randomizer live streams right here on YouTube. Then you can help us reach our goal of 50 Patreons, where I will tackle said endurance races along with a 1000 miles championship, a set of endurance races with classic cars, starting with 25 laps in the Nürburgring and 99 laps in Monaco. It will mean a lot to me to reach this goal by the end of August, given I want to invest this money in bringing new games and improving the quality of my streams. You will find a link to my Patreon in the description. Now, I hope you enjoyed the next video. Gran Turismo 4 happens to have a massive amount of content, to the point where reaching 100% completion can take months of hard work, but there's one obstacle which leaves rent free in our minds to this day, driving missions, a set of 34 races with a specific set of handicaps for the player. The absurd difficulty of these missions has become near legendary amongst the Gran Turismo fanbase, and after descending into madness after playing them live on YouTube, which you can find on the playlist in the description of this video, I figured I will bring my own experience with all 34 of them, put together in a video. However, which one of these missions was the most challenging for you? Leave your experience in the comments below. Despite its reputation, the first 10 driving missions are ridiculously easy. These take place in small sections across different tracks, where an unsuspicious opponent awaits to be overtaken. This first mission brings a returning character on this channel, the Fiat 500, which has an icon on my Discord server, the link is in the description. This is probably the slowest overtake in history as you have to sit behind another Fiat 500 until the first corner of the forest. It's kind of funny how there's a small uphill section which sends the 500 into a crawl, a feeling I am all too familiar with and I don't need to experience again. These missions have a peculiar feeling to them, almost as if they were rejected license tests. I believe one should know how to overtake if they got a racing license. However, Gran Turismo 4 believes you should know how to lap Tsukuba with a Mini Cooper with God knows how many driving aids. No wonder most of us end up die bombing the AI. Guilty as charged here. Despite the slow start, these 10 missions have all sorts of different cars to drive, which makes them a good exercise when it comes to learning the basics of handling different drivetrain layouts, especially under steery front wheel drive cars such as the Volkswagen Golf. Maintaining a speed through midfield raceway can be difficult with this setup, at least for a new driver. And that's kind of the problem with these driving missions as they are unlocked by receiving the International B license. By now any player shouldn't have an issue driving different cars, meaning these missions don't present a challenge at all. I suppose a special mention should be made for mission 10, which takes place at the Mulsan Strait in Le Mans. For one, this is the only mission until now which features multiple opponents, three to be exact. Compared to previous tests, Slipstream plays a vital role in completing this mission, as these cars have to be overtaken at different sections of the strait. Relying on the chicanes isn't enough in order to achieve first place. Place. While it is a simple mission, there is one undeniable fact which makes it the best in the entire game. We get to drive a Renault Avant time, or Avant like? You should totally leave a like on this video, I agree. But sadly, it's time to leave this French masterpiece behind and start with the real driving missions. Missions 11 to 20 are called 3 lap battles, where the player starts in last place and has to climb their way into first before the end of the race. Thing is, the leading car usually has a massive advantage which means the these three laps have to be almost perfect. Average laps just won't cut it. We are talking about gaining seconds on each timer split. These circuits have to be pretty fresh in your mind as missing a braking zone could be fatal for the run. The other part of the challenge comes with ensuring a good pace with cars which have less than optimal setups, pretty much being stuck with driving aids which handicap their driving, along with some bizarre tire choices. A perfect example of this behavior is Mission 11, the first on this set which provides a steep difficulty jump compared to the previous 10 missions. This race takes place at New York, where classic Japanese sport cars have taken the streets. We have a classic Mazda Cosmo with a comfortable lead of 30 seconds at least, while we get to drive a stunning Toyota 2000 GT, one of my favorite Japanese classics. In a circuit like New York, where top speed and acceleration are vital, this Toyota should have a solid advantage over the field. However, this isn't quite the case. The biggest problem comes with the fact it has come for 
for tires, one of three sets of tires which come for free at any dealership. Yes, they are that bad. With next to no grip, you have to start braking in New Jersey to make each turn. The first turn of the circuit manages to showcase the terrible handling which is amplified by a very soft suspension setup. The first area of the circuit is the run killer in my experience, because most people will misjust the braking prowess of this Toyota or enter the following corner way too fast and lose too much time trying to correct. For one, it's good that it only takes a few seconds to restart and try this first section again, but it has to be done at three different times to win. The next section requires the same attention to detail with multiple 90 degree corners which the AI isn't really good with. This is an area where driving aids can become a minor annoyance as they cripple acceleration when triggered, and it's not like we're carrying much speed. The key to beat this mission lies on nailing each braking zone. Break early by the love of god or you won't make the turns. It's better to have clean cornering and take advantage of higher top speeds during the straights. The opponent themselves are kind of helpless given most overtakes will be done at these straights. It's tempting to break a bit later but this is slower. I find this mission introduces everyone to a very vital concept which often goes ignored. Patience. You can make contact with these opponents because it will give you a 5 second penalty. Same applies for the walls. A constant pace is better than pushing to gaining one section only to end up in disaster and forcing yet another restart. Usually you will overtake the leading car during the final lap and I feel a lot of the challenges come when people treat this as an ordinary race and start to make mistakes, forcing the cars where there isn't anything to be gained. After meeting enough walls and getting used to wish tires, you will finally cross the finish line on first place and you'll be rewarded with mission 12 which provides a complete change of pace. For one, we are handed the keys for a race car, none other than the Ford GT LM, the cover car of Gran Turismo 4. This baby soars for 3 laps in Laguna Seca where a Dodge Viper GTSR sits on the lead. Funny how this event show how few American race cars are available in Gran Turismo 4. The last two places are taken by the concept version of the Viper GTSR and the Salinas 7 respectively. These two are quick but totally out of place and should be overtaken by the end of the first lap, leaving three remaining race cars to deal with. The Ford GT handles like a dream with excellent grip. It does have some low speed understeer which can present a challenge in the first section of Laguna Seca, which is why you want to point the front and push your way out with throttle inputs. Lifting up helps the car rotate slightly if required. It has my type of handling so I got familiar with it after a few attempts. Even if jumping to a race car after driving the Toyota can be crippling, you have to adjust your timing and inputs towards the other extreme and this jump can be jarring for a novice driver. Hell, even I struggle with switching cars in such a sudden fashion. And I've been playing this game for a decade already. Despite my skill issues, this is one of the most entertaining driving missions in the entire roster. Laguna Seca is a rewarding circuit to drive fast and the 4GT pushes you into getting the most out of it, even if you should be prepared to meet the sand a few times. There is one detail however which makes this mission work so well. For some reason, this is the only one out of the 34 where driving gates are disabled. I suppose they realized they were unnecessary with this car, even if you should be careful in the corkscrew. Keep the car on third gear, there's no need to thank me. With mission 12 completed, we leave America and we head towards Europe. Mission 13 takes place in another infamous urban circuit, Opera Paris, where a pack of rally cars have taken the streets and await to be overtaken. We get to drive their crown jewel, the Peugeot 206 WRC, while chasing a Ford Focus WRC on the lead. This mission isn't easy thanks to the track layout. It's difficult to make time in Paris. Composed of high turns, most of the lap is tackled at low speeds. The key here is the same as New York, find the appropriate braking spots, which in this case are much later than one might think. The 206 has really good brakes and it will grip given the appropriate line is taken. One has to expect a bit of understeer given this is an all-wheel drive rally car, where the front slash rear torque split must be quite high. The car reacts better under throttle until it starts to understeer again. As much as Opera Paris isn't a saint of my devotion, I have to say it works well with this car. You never feel limited or cheated because this car is undrivable, but you do have to be careful in this corner as you can indeed enter rather fast and make time, but the rear of the 206 will be really unsettled, so proceed with caution, don't want to spin at the final lap. However, the main challenge with this mission comes with overtakes, given we have a really narrow circuit to deal with, finding a good spot to overtake is hard, really hard, to the point where one has to take a calculated risk and make contact with opponents at times.
games. This is a bad idea given a penalty is a guaranteed restart, unless you know. Yes, you have played this game in your sleep as well, and you know there are ways of making contact and avoiding the penalty. How exactly? I don't know, I still haven't figured it out, but you can, and I have done multiple times in this video. I still don't know how that overtake on the Corolla is legitimate, and again on the fourth focus, but such is the nature of mission 13. I'll take my victory without a word. Thank you, Gran Turismo Gods. We return to America for mission 14, for a classic muscle car showdown behind the wheel of a Plymouth Superbird. The leading car is a big special, which is funny because this is a resto mod which is heavily modified and decimates any classic car on the field. Yeah, this is kind of unfair. For one, the Superbird is a complete boat with really soft suspension and terrible brakes, a fatal flaw in Seattle's circuit which has a few brutal braking zones. If this isn't enough to lower your confidence, let me tell you this massive muscle car is running on economy tires. Yes, it's back to wish tires once again. Driving this car will be challenging, as you need to extract everything out of it. Maybe it's just my driving style which doesn't add up to it, but this mission took me a while as I couldn't crack the formula, losing time to the leading Buick and failing miserably. The key lies on taking different lines to carry more speed through each corner. The first corner provides an excellent example, where taking a wider line allows the Superbird to carry more speed. The following section with jumps presents the biggest challenge for me. The fact you have to make an overtake in this section and the braking zone is so specific makes it a prime location for restarts. It's better to overtake these four cars past the first timer, if not just restart again. Getting past these cars early not only serves as a metric for pace, having a clear track is vital to avoid incidents with the AI and having all the corners for yourself, allowing for optimal lines. However, the special is terrible while tackling corners, even more so in the final section of the track. Once you get to terms with the handling of the original Big Wing Master Race, overtaking the Buick should come by the end of the race. This mission manages to be a test of patience and lures drivers into making lots of mistakes by forcing one to push out of fear. However, don't let this rush get into your mind. Consistent pace wins the race. Classic cars take the streets of Monaco for mission 15, where a Lancia Stratos is the car of choice. We have three laps to catch another Italian classic, the Alfa Romeo Giulia Sprint, which has a lead of more than 40 seconds. At first, this seems massive. How are you supposed to gain 40 seconds on Monaco of all places? However, this mission happens to be quite easy, as the rest of the pack is slower than the Stratos by a wide margin. There's even a Fiat 500 in 5th place. God, I'm so glad I'm not driving that car anymore. It has to be said, this isn't a free mission, however. As usual, knowing the track is vital. It's braking zones, to be exact. This Stratos is running once again on wish tires. Braking distances aren't brilliant and neither is grip at high speeds. In areas like the tunnel, by example, and the chicane afterwards, which I slammed into a couple of times. Given this is a very narrow track, part of the challenge lies in overtaking without making contact, because you'll get a penalty and meet the restart button once again. Outside that, it's a pretty simple mission which is a change of pace in need. Mission 16 takes place in Suzuka. Everyone is driving the same new Beetle Cup car, including the player, who starts at least 15 seconds behind. For a change, the car isn't ungodly and drives really well. It has good grip and excellent brakes which allow you to push braking zones further than might one expect. The AI seems to drive with caution and this is noticeable at corner entry, where they seem to brake too early. They just lack the ability to push with this car. Maybe it's me, but I found this mission really easy, despite some risky overtakes. My advice will be to trust in this Beetle, as it has brilliant handling. If you know Suzuka well enough, this car will carry you. Truly an enjoyable mission. Mission 17 is a similar story, three laps at infinite with the Audi R8. Not the supercar, but the Le Mans prototype. There is a mix of race cars in this grid, however the only one of our concern is the leading Bentley Speed 8. The key of this challenge lies once again on getting to terms with this car. Infineon can be difficult at first, especially the first uphill corners which have to be taken slower than it may seem at first sight. The overtakes are also rather difficult as there's a big risk of contact, so they require a bit of practice and good luck in some cases. It also has to be said the timing can be rather tight, so there's little room for error. Still, it's rewarding to tackle the circuit with the Audi, making Mission 17 one of the community favorites and I rather enjoy it as well. Mission 18 is a return to suffering. At first sight, getting the keys for a Nissan R92CB is a pleasure. It's one of the best cars in the game, a Group C racer which is born for driving flat out through the Mulsan straight, which we get to experience for 3 laps. There is a Mercedes Sauber C9 on the lead which has over 30 
seconds on the Nissan. The problem with this mission comes with the car, because the Nissan here doesn't have the best handling. For one, it's running on super hard tires, which while they are racing as lakes, happen to have the least grip out of the 5 options available. These tires work on slower cars, like the Porsche 206 and the Beetle from Mission 13 and 16 respectively. These two have these tires, but they feel like concrete blocks on a race car with 800 horsepower. It has this bizarre issue where one can feel the car pushing through corners thanks to downforce rather than tire grip, causing a false sense of confidence where one can lose all its grip without notice and head straight into the sand. It goes without saying, this mistake will end your run and it's better to restart, given Lessard is the second longest circuit in Gran Turismo 4 and most of the lap is done at full throttle, there are more chances of making mistakes than in any other test until now. I find the worst area of the circuit comes with the Dunlap Bridge. This corner is vital to start the race at a reasonable pace and this car really dislikes it. You have to brake really hard and just turn, hoping the curves don't destroy your run. The Nissan also struggles with the twisty section after our Nash thanks to its lack of grip, so it takes a lot of practice to clock reasonable laps. Most people will just take a creative line through the final chicane which saves a lot of time, or find themselves pressured to do so by a certain YouTube chat, but that's another story. I do feel like I have to mention the Nissan is faster in the straights, even if the mission preview gets the top speed wrong, it won't reach 400 km per hour no matter what. With all of this considered, this mission is hard, so tackle appropriately and you will cross the finish line on first, or just cut the chicanes. For mission 19, we return to Suzuka, well the first section of it anyway. This is one of the most bizarre events in the entire roster. Everyone is driving the same car, the amused S2000 and they all start back together. It doesn't make sense, until you reach the first corner and it all starts to make sense. These cars are running on comfort tires, seems Wish is selling a lot of these. Rear wheel drive cars with cheap tires means drifting, lots of drifting, which is why this mission is kind of hilarious as you have to fight the driving gates which constantly cut off acceleration. I never seen the traction control light work so hard in its life. I admit handling in this car isn't too bad, and if anything, it's hilarious to see the AI spin and struggle to drive. So this mission isn't hard, but rather random and fun, and not curiosity in the catalog. And we made it to the final 3 lap battle, mission 20, which takes place at Tsukuba. In this race, the opponents are driving iconic Japanese sport cars, while we get to drive a Nissan Micra. But it's not an ordinary Micra, it's a cup car with racing tires and brakes. In Tsukuba, this is the original Gran Turismo Challenge run formula, where a slow car finds redemption in technical sections and superior handling. One has to drive well to win this mission, as it's vital to delay braking to make your way past the pack as soon as possible, and you really want to be second before the back straight. There's no hope of being competitive in a straight, forget about it. But the final turn provides a good opportunity as the AI will struggle to maintain their speed, not the Micra. It will grip better than them, allowing for some gains. This is one of my favorite missions in the entire roster. If anything, it feels like a template which all should follow. It's a challenge which rewards good drivers and doesn't force you to drive an ungodly car. Looking at you, Superbird, everything feels tailor-made for Mission 20. The car works really well in Suku and it still manages to present a challenge, as making those overtakes without getting any sort of penalty can be difficult. It makes for a nice wrap-up of 3 lap battles. I find these are some of the hardest missions in the game thanks to their length and the fact one has to make near-perfect laps in order to win. Some of the cars given are terrible and I believe Mission 11 itself might be the reason why some people have stopped playing them. But we have to discuss the following set which might be the most unique out of the 34 driving missions. The following 4 missions, from 21 to 24, are called Slipstream Battles. These missions take place in Test Track, a 10km oval circuit where laps can be done without releasing the throttle. The objective in this race lies on overtaking each opponent by slipstreaming. They aren't too difficult in my experience as all you have to do is remain behind these opponents and catch up to them after entering their slipstream, which might take a bit of time. However, they tend to slow down for the bends which is useful, given everyone is driving the same car with the same top speed. It is funny to sit there and see the speedometer climb as you finally reach your first opponent and you start to climb through each position, even more so with these bizarre car choices. The first mission has a pack of Nissan Cubes, probably one of the most fitting names for a car ever. It is a slow, it has terrible aerodynamics and can be rather luck dependent at times, but it's nothing major. The following mission has a pack of Honda Odyssey bands, probably the only time you will lose this car, and there's something hilarious about driving these land ships past 200 km per hour. I am all up for some bizarre races, not everything has to be a challenge to be fun. There's also mission 24 where we get to drive a modified Honda S2000 by Amuse, which can go past 300 
500 kilometers per hour. I really need to drive this car because I'm curious what it can do in a proper racetrack. However, there is one elephant in the room which people who have played this game before remember with frustration. One of the reasons why people haven't complete driving missions lies with Mission 23. It has a different approach compared to the rest of Sleepstream battles where opponents are all lined up. Instead, there's a single yellow Skyline R34 sitting along with a 14 second lead, while the rest of opponents are packed together with us. At first glance this seems impossible given one can overtake the rest of the pack, but given everyone is moving at the same speed, it won't be enough to shrink the gap with the yellow GTR. A bit of clever thinking is required to solve this puzzle, with the four cars near us being the key. In order to win this race one has to let the AI slipstream and overtake, in order to feed off their own slipstream and overtake them again, using this a small speed boost to gain ground and finally reach the leading GTR before the end of the race. This is the only viable strategy as letting them bumping you by example will only lead with the player stuck in no man's land as the AI will be unable to catch up. I understand why people start to make absurd suggestions like never going past 5th gear even while sleepstreaming the AI. This mission is a test of patience because these opponents just won't cooperate unless they are held. How? Look behind you. This is test course and there's nothing to worry ahead. With this in mind now we pray to the AI to see the light and realize we are giving them a toe. If one of them doesn't bite before the second straight, restart. When it comes to the event, remember these opponents to slow down and won't take advantage of sleep streaming through them for some bizarre reason. They just sit there. Worry not, they'll pick up the pace as soon as they enter the straights, which is why you want to make sure they are trailing right at your 6 o'clock. Another rather difficult trick comes with timing as you really want them to remain on sleep stream range until the last moment, which is why you want to weave out of their path rather than them making the overtake. The reason for this is simple, the AI takes too long to overtake and each bit of a straightaway counts to gain speed. This mission can be really random as sometimes you might get blocked by the AI, forced into a spin, unnecessarily bumped and so on. Things which happen during my livestream run if you want to see them. Personally, I don't think this mission is hard, it's just a massive, frustrating coin flip as you rely on the AI to do as one expects them. However, if you ensure they remain behind you, the Skyline train will have a Bayside Blue leader by the end. With Sleepstream battles completed, the next set of missions are called One Lap Magic. There are two groups of these missions, from 25 to 29 and to 30 to 34. The truth is they can be grouped together given they all share similar traits. As the name suggests, these races are only one lap long, where a slower car starts on first place and it's our duty to catch it before the finish line. Usually we are behind the wheel of a race car, or some other car which is overpowered, while the opponents have to settle with slower cars. The trick here is the same as 3 lap battles, as they have a time advantage over the player. However, unlike 3 lap battles where the opponents were already scattered over the track, here we all sit together in the grid, waiting for every single opponent to start the race, until the countdown reaches 0 and it's finally our time to start. This waiting time happens to be the worst part of 1 lap magic missions, as it's not only tedious to sit here and wait for 90 seconds as each opponent starts the race, it also means one has to wait an absurd amount of time before having a chance to retry the race. And this add up quickly. I cannot explain how annoying it is to touch the grass with a single wheel, a spin and end up waiting the north side of a minute in order to start your lap again. Outside this fact, missions 25 to 29 are rather easy, surprisingly. For one, each car drives really well. The first mission of this group is a reunion on different Nissan set, where the player drives the Mosul Pitwork set at Fuji Speedway without chicanes. Honestly, the only problem which one can face here is overtaking the AI drivers at the final turn, as they can weave and block, so it's best to go a bit wide and take the outside. The waiting period is not short, so it's not a bad mission all things considered. Mission 26 takes place at Suzuka, where a gathering of different Honda models is taking place. The most annoying part in this mission is the waiting time. We are talking about 90 seconds where you'll do nothing until it's finally time to start. And yes, you have to recover a minute and a half in a single lap. Thank god the NSX is up to the task. These missions aren't too bad if you know the circuits well enough and have a bit of patience, as one usually gets to take the lead right before the finish line. Mission 27 takes us to Laguna Seca, or Master Raceway Laguna Seca as it's called in Gran Turismo 4, because it was owned by them at the time of its release. We have another Master Cosmo in the lead for a Mission 11 throwback, while the player gets a chance to drive the Master 787B. It's one of the best cars in the game. The only concern comes with some risky overtakes given Laguna Seca is a rather tight circuit. Still a fun mission anyway. We return to Fuji for mission 28.
upgrades, the 2005 layout at least. This time it's a reunion of Toyota Celica which makes me wonder why they didn't give us a more iconic WRC Celica rather than this thing. Then again, this mission isn't too hard because the opponents seem to be really slow for some bizarre reason. Nothing to note outside being cautious with overtakes as usual in order to avoid penalties. America strikes back for mission 29, where a gathering of Corvettes takes place at Infinite Raceway. It's nice to see the classic C1 at the lead. This is the first year of the Corvette and it didn't have a V8, which is crazy given how much of the Corvette legend is built around this engine layout. We get to drive the iconic C5R with its yellow and black paint scheme. I am somewhat nostalgic of this car because I remember it being one of the first times I heard about the 24 hours of Le Mans. There was a small documentary about it and the team who raced them, but it's been ages since then. And now I'm more focused on not crashing into these guys. This is another where you'll have to wait until the last second in order to win, but still, it's easy enough. Given this is Gran Turismo, we return to the land of the rising sun for mission 30. This time, it's Subaru who takes us to a journey of their history, starting with the 360, which is among the slowest cars in the entire game. The entire grid is composed by legacy and impresas, with us joining the team with the latest rally car of 2004. This mission is curious because the slow 360 has a 50 second lead, while the rest of the grid starts rather close to us. This race can be a bit chaotic as one can lose their temper trying to gain ground, forcing unnecessary mistakes. Fear not, however, the impress is up to the task and you'll get there. Just make sure to take a really good line at the final corner or you will be humiliated by a 360, just how it happened to me live. Missions 31 to 33 take the same format as the previous one Lab Magic, only we are given a street car to tackle them. I think these three can also be grouped together. Mission 31 with the Lotus is really easy as it takes place in high speed ring and the opponents are slower by a wide margin. Mission 32 is a recipe for disaster, a far GT unleashed in Seattle circuit. Despite the weird handling and brakes of the GT, it's really easy and it shouldn't take too long. Mission 33 takes us to Infineon yet again, this time with a Cadillac CN. Out of the three, this is the one which can be a bit difficult because the CN isn't the best handling car, in a circuit where handling is absolutely vital. But again, this shouldn't take too long to win. And you better enjoy this mission, because it's the last time you'll be happy playing this. You all know this was coming, the hardest mission in the entire game, the reason why people never finish driving missions. Let me bring those dramatic memories with two words. Mission 34. The reason why this mission is so ungodly comes with a combination of factors. First is the circuit as we visit the legendary Green Hell. It's the first and only mission which takes place at the Nürburgring, which is the biggest circuit in the entire game. The sheer length of the circuit makes it difficult to maintain your focus for an entire lap, let alone remain consistent through it all while pushing to gain on each section. This little detail goes hand in hand with the fact Nürburgring isn't a slow circuit. It's composed by sections where you'll be driving at top speed while sorting corners which require a very specific line. Having a predictable, good handling car is vital, but we don't get that luxury. The car given to the player is the Mercedes-Benz SLR McLaren. That is a long name, however, so we will refer it to as the SLR. The SLR here is a car which doesn't inspire confidence. The game's warning is one of the understatements of the century. The first characteristic which stands out is the weight. The SLR is a heavy car, a front-heavy car which understeers, and one has to correct with this behavior in mind. Breaking distances are quite bad as well given we are running common sport tires in a car with 600 horsepower. The size of the SLR is also a handicap, and Nürburgring is a rather narrow circuit, which means any minor correction can result in a wheel of two touching the grass. You can say goodbye to grip and any chances of victory. It doesn't help that any mistake will make you restart and you have to wait two minutes, yes, two whole minutes before having a chance to try this race again. And believe me, you will spend hours in this ungodly countdown where the 300 is Yell gets a 2 minutes lead. It's even worse when those restarts are forced by the AI and their paths as they decide to ruin your life by moving into your lines and forcing penalties. I do not know how I avoided one there. This mission is frustrating and full of chaotic moments, given one has to attempt it multiple times. I spent 5 hours trying to beat it on the stream and I have to resort to creative racing lines at the end. In my defense, driving and talking can be hard and I managed to do a better attempt off screen where I didn't resort to any of this tricks, which reminds me how useful, or rather broken, save states are in these missions. In mission 34, by example, one can use them to splice the runs and put together the best time on each section together, which I had to do for my livestream so my chat didn't go crazy. In my defense, I played them way before emulation, meaning I had to do every mission the honest way as a child. And yes, it is really frustrating
waiting to make mistakes right at the end and sit there waiting for your next chance and spend another 4 hours to reach that point again. I believe the key to this mission lies in track knowledge and patience above all. While the SLR can be tough to drive, I think compared to other cars forced upon the player in different missions, it's mid-tier? I mean it's not good, but I'd rather drive this instead of anything in which tires ever again. This car will fight you, usually under steering of the corners as it doesn't have enough grip unless one takes rather specific lines. Finding these lines is the challenge itself, as they take a lot of trial and error, but once you invest enough time in hell, you will cross the finish line in first, finally completing all the driving missions, all 34 of them. Unless you've been playing in PAL where the gap with the SL is 8 seconds less and can be completed with your hands tied. And of course there's always the absolute genius who says oh I complete this mission in 3 attempts. And they never mentioned the version they were playing. Funny that, huh? After spending so much time, one has enough reasons to feel proud, completing a feat which broke so many people. All of these to earn the f***ing 4th K. Yes, I got a 4K for mission 34 on my randomizer run. Life isn't fair. Despite the suffering, I think driving missions are a special part of Gran Turismo 4. For one, they created the idea of challenging races which many of us try to replicate in our runs, with a disadvantage which has to be covered. While they are flawed in execution, with 3 lap battles having car choices which are questionable at best, when one has to drive them in a hot lap fashion for more than 5 minutes in most cases. Slipstream battles have one of the most RNG reliant events in the history of racing games, where you are left at the mercy of the brain dead AI. Then, one lap magic makes the player wait for absurd amounts of time before having a chance to retry these races, but they are a new way of racing which I find rather endearing when it does work. If you made it this far, then it's time to thank my patrons. We thank them as follows. Or amateur racers? Professional racers? and world champions, Blind Dev, See What Happens Racing UK, Whiskey Tuesday, Sundere Kiseli, Enzo Lasonieri, Raciel, Hunter Kaufman, Josh Big, Astin, Crusader Glenn, and Jade. And we have a last minute addition, Lonnie Murray. If you wish to support my endeavors as these wonderful people have done, you can find a link to my Patreon in the description of this video. You can enjoy early access to my videos along with a special role in our Discord server. All of this is starting at $3 a month. We also have a goal, if we reach 50 Patreons, I will tackle the 1000 miles championship and endurance races with a 4K in Gran Turismo 4 Randomizer, a playthrough I'm currently doing live here on YouTube. With that said, I hope you have enjoyed this video and left a like or a dislike if you didn't. I'll see you all next time, take care and bye for now.